So good afternoon. We are so excited to see you all here today. My name is Shelby Fiegel and I'm the director of the Center for Community and Economic Development and the Community Development Institute at the University of Central Arkansas. I, along with my staff, Dylan Edgel, our assistant director, and Emily Cooper Yates, our project coordinator, are so thankful that you all are joining us today for the first ever Arkansas Racial Equity Summit. We also wanna make sure that we thank our partners in this event, RCARE, the Conway Area Chamber of Commerce, and Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas. Their support has made this event possible, and many of them are with us today representing their organizations. Our team decided to hold this event because our core values at UCA are diversity, community, intellectual excellence, and integrity. We are dedicated to finding ways to be more intentional in designing content and moving the needle on racial equity and justice in Arkansas. We recognize that creating equity is a necessary and crucial part of community and economic development. And at this time, to give you a further welcome to campus, I would like to introduce the University of Central Arkansas President, Dr. Houston Davis. Thank you very much, Shelby, and, and welcome all of you, uh, if not virtually, uh, to campus. Uh, UCA is, is, is delighted to be able uh, to serve as a host and organizer, and, and as Shelby mentioned, we really appreciate our care and electric cooperatives and Conway Chamber uh, for always being great partners with us. Uh, Shelby also mentioned a little bit about kind of core values and mission of this university. If you, if you want to encapsulate our, our mission, uh, remember the, the term AVID, it stands for academic vitality, integrity, and diversity. Um, and, and some part of those three things are all spelled out in um, our, our core mission statement and the role that we play. And one of those things that I think those of you that know me know that I see a modern university as being called to be a steward of place. Uh, you should wake up every day thinking about how your research, your teaching, your service assets align with economic, social, educational, quality of life, human development um, aspects. And sometimes um, you might not necessarily take the lead on something. You might merely be a convener. Um, in some ways, we become a convener in this role today in, in bringing voices together to be a part of a very, very important conversation. Uh, but, but either way, you become a steward when you're willing to lean into that conversation. And, and I'm, we're very proud uh, to be a part of this today. We were just getting a little organized before we allowed the waiting room in. You've got a lot of heavy hitters. We appreciate Dr. Barnes uh, leading off the conversation today and, and our moderators and panelists, uh, some of the leading voices in communities all throughout our state. And the fact that 250 plus uh, individuals had signed up for, and I think we're heading up toward 275 potential participants in this dialogue today. The last thing I'll say is, Shelby said the first conversation, let's make this the inaugural, which means that we're gonna have multiple. Um, let's make certain to keep it going beyond just the conversation of this day. Appreciate all that you do. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for waking up every day, looking to make your communities better than you found it. Um, that's in the end, how we continue making progress in society. Thank you very much and glad to have you here. Thank you so much, President Davis. We're so glad you could join us this afternoon to give that welcome. And I definitely agree. I'm gonna change my original comment from first ever to first ever and inaugural, because we will definitely be following up on these conversations that we're having. Uh, so I do, as President Davis said, we have um, over 250 people registered to attend this event. Right now we're admitting almost 150 to the conversation. I'm sure we'll have more join us throughout the afternoon. Uh, we hope that the summit provides a space to learn about the history of racial injustice in Arkansas and provides you with information on what inequities exist today in several different areas, such as health, education, wealth and income, and the criminal justice system. And we're gonna culminate those conversations with interactive discussions led by Just Communities of Arkansas on what we can do to counteract those inequities to create a better future for our state. Before we get started, I also wanna thank our fantastic lineup of, as President Davis said, those heavy hitters, our speakers and moderators. We are thankful they took time out of their busy schedules to share their knowledge and expertise with us. And you can learn more about them and their detailed biographies uh, in an email that Dylan Edgel sent out this morning. I also wanna share that though the summit is going to be recorded by our staff,
Only the first session will be shared with the public. Our goal for this event is to have an open, honest, and sometimes difficult conversation this afternoon about these topics. And we don't wanna restrict those conversations in any way. So we want everyone to feel comfortable in engaging with one another in those conversations. Dylan Emily, UCA Director of Conference Services, Melanie Watson and myself will be taking very detailed notes throughout our sessions to share those back with everybody, but rest assured that all of that commentary will be aggregated for privacy. The final note I have is the crucial piece of Zoom. Please make sure that you are on mute throughout the event until we share it's appropriate for questions and open conversations, which we most definitely want to have, but there are appropriate times for that and non-appropriate times. Uh, with that, let's get started. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Kenneth Barnes. Dr. Barnes is a graduate of UCA with a PhD in history from Duke University. He has taught at Concordia University Chicago and the University of Southern Mississippi before returning to UCA where he is a professor of history. He's the author of several books on Arkansas and Southern history and his latest book on the Ku Klux Klan of Arkansas will be published in April by the University of Arkansas Press. With that, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Barnes and if you'd please share your screen with us and get started. Okay. Thanks very much, and uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today and see you, even though you're just a little square on my screen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you to talk about a really important subject. Uh, you're a little bit bigger group than I usually get to teach to, so it's, it's, I'm quite excited to get to talk about history to uh, a, a group of community members with diverse backgrounds like yourself. So let me pull up my PowerPoint and get started. Okay, I'm gonna to have to go backwards. I, I'm at the end, I'll go, okay, here we go. Uh, just a little more work. Okay, you can see my topic, um, racial injustice uh, in Arkansas history. And to do this, I wanna start actually at the beginning, uh, which uh, of course is, let's see, uh, with slavery in Arkansas. And actually, Arkansas's experience with slavery uh, is pretty much like that of other states. There's not really anything that's that unique about it. I guess my comment that I'd want to make about slavery in Arkansas is that it was less of an entrenched institution in Arkansas than it would be in other slave states. Uh, before the Civil War, uh, slavery and plantation agriculture was just really getting to Arkansas. So there, wasn't as, there weren't as many slaves. Uh, in Arkansas as there were elsewhere. You see the number I have there, 11, 111,000 slaves in the state in 1860, which was about a quarter of the population. And that's relatively small uh, compared to other Southern states or other states that would be part of the Confederacy. Uh, in fact, of those Confederate states, uh, only Florida had fewer number of slaves than did Arkansas. Uh, and there were a couple of slave states that didn't join the Confederacy, Missouri and Kentucky, that actually had more slaves in Arkansas. So I think in some ways it's a similar pattern, uh, but uh, in, I think in comparison, uh, slavery wasn't as present uh, simply because there weren't as many people in Arkansas and the economy wasn't as well developed here. One distinctive feature that I would mention that makes a slavery in Arkansas and race issues a little bit different than elsewhere uh, was the third bullet I have in this, in this slide. And that Arkansas in its, uh, the General Assembly of, of Arkansas in 1859 uh, passed a law that went into effect on the 1st of January in 1860 that made it so that you could only be free and black. I'm sorry, you could only be slave and black if you lived in Arkansas. If you were free, uh, but a person of color, you had to leave the state. Uh, and Arkansas was the only state uh, that had such a law. Uh, and uh, Mississippi had some similar laws, but they were restrictive. Uh, but the only blanket law uh, forbidding free blacks to reside in a state was passed uh, in Arkansas. But of course, that didn't um, last very long because not long after January 1st, 1860, uh, Arkansas was in the midst of civil war. 
And the Civil War certainly is going to have a huge impact on race and slavery and people of color in this state. Um, but I think one remark I'd make about Arkansas and what might be a little bit different than what people might think about the state uh, in the Civil War is that uh, there was quite a bit of ambivalent feelings about slavery and about secession. Uh, it took two sessions uh, of a convention to consider secession before Arkansas actually seceded. The first uh, convention to discuss secession I did, concluded that Arkansas wouldn't secede. Uh, only at a second time after the firing of Fort Sumter uh, in 1861 did uh, the convention decide to secede. So it, it's, it's kind of interesting to imagine the what ifs. What if Arkansas followed Missouri to the north or Kentucky as a slave state that actually didn't join the Confederacy uh, as of course it did. One other factor just to think about with that is that of course we're familiar with uh, Arkansans who fought in the Confederate Army. More than 40,000 Arkansans did fight in uh, rebel blue. But what's I think much less known is that there were uh, quite a number of Arkansans, white and black, who fought in the Union Army. In fact, Arkansas was second only to Tennessee of Confederate states uh, in the number of white men who chose to fight for the Union rather than the Confederacy. And you see the numbers there. I think that's something that will be practically forgotten. It may even surprise you to hear it uh, today um, because later on when there will be monuments erected, like in uh, Conway here, to the soldiers who died serving the Confederacy, it was practically forgotten that there were in many of these same counties in Arkansas numbers of uh, white and also black uh, men who had fought for the Union Army. I have some pictures of three right there uh, as representatives, and I might just mention to you that the two white guys uh, were my ancestors on my mother's side on the left, and then on the right on my father's side, uh, who both fought uh, in Arkansas regiments uh, for the, the Union. Uh, in fact, both who were killed in their service in the Civil War. Okay. Uh, reconstruction that will follow the Civil War will bring some victories for people of color, but also some new challenges. Obviously, freedom is the big issue, the 13th Amendment that officially ends slavery in the United States, and then followed by the 14th Amendment that brought citizenship rights, and then 15th Amendment that broadly brought, brought civil rights uh, in a significant measure, sort of had to be redone in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act by Congress, but uh, the Constitution was quite clear with this amendment that uh, freed men and women ha had basic uh, civil rights. Um, but that didn't last long. There was a challenge to it after the Civil War was over uh, by Confederates, former Confederates who organized beginning in 1867 and 1868 here in Arkansas into the Ku Klux Klan which was organized specifically as a terrorist organization, a paramilitary organization, a sort of citizen's militia um, to keep black men basically from registering to vote, or if they somehow managed to register to vote, uh, to actually vote when elections came. You, the illustration that you see there to the right uh, is from the period, and it shows the kinds of crazy costumes uh, that they used and often making nocturnal appearances to simply scare uh, black families and terrorize them to staying home instead of coming out to claim the rights that had been given to them uh, by the government and registering to vote and then voting. This happened, of course, throughout the South. Uh, the Klan was organized, uh, founded in Memphis. There were some Arkansas people at the original meeting of that uh, Klan uh, in Memphis. Uh, and there were Klan chapters active in Arkansas in 1868, especially in pretty much all parts of the state, uh, all the parts of the state where there were black people who were uh, registering to vote. Uh, however, the difference, one thing that makes Arkansas unique in this regard is that the governor of Arkansas, uh, who had been formerly a uh, uh, general in the Union Army, a so-called carpetbagger who had moved to Arkansas from Pennsylvania, uh, his name was Powell Clayton, organized and called up um, the state militia, what we might call the National Guard. He called out the troops 
uh, and some black troops, some white troops, some of these people who had fought in Union uniforms uh, during the Civil War were called back into service uh, to rise up against the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, there were some even pitched battles, if you can imagine it, in 1868 uh, between these Republican militias called out by the governor and the Klan. Uh, but in all cases, uh, the uh, law and order prevailed. Uh, and uh, the Klan was basically uh, removed as a presence in Arkansas much more successfully than in other states. I think uh, historians give Governor Powell Clayton uh, credit for being singularly effective in uh, putting down the Klan. Uh, it was less, other governors in other states were less successful. Okay, after Reconstruction or after the threat of uh, this takeaway of uh, basic rights for freed men and women. Um, uh, there was sort of a golden age of sorts. The 1870s and the 1880s in Arkansas were a time, I call it a promise, when uh, black men were voting and in fact held offices. Uh, they were members of the state legislature and both the House and the Senate. Uh, in several of the counties of Arkansas, particularly in Eastern Arkansas, uh, some that had black majorities or large black minorities, uh, black men were elected to uh, county uh, offices. Uh, so that's hard to imagine actually from the perspective of the 20th century uh, when that had faded away from people's memory. But between 1868 and uh, about 1892, it was fairly common for there to be black election, elected officials uh, and of course black men voting um, in elections, state and federal elections. In the same period of time in the 1870s and 1880s, there was a very large migration of African Americans from other states in the South, actually for reasons of that Arkansas was just a better place that had more opportunities for people. The word got out. Uh, the, um, in some of the other states of the South, like Mississippi and South Carolina and Louisiana, when Reconstruction ended between 1874 and 1878, and by that I mean federal troops uh, keeping order, retreated back, and uh, things were turned back over to governments of Southerners. Uh, when that happened in some of these other states, immediately there uh, came to be a kind of a clampdown uh, against uh, people of color. But in Arkansas in the 1870s and 1880s, it remained relatively calm, uh, and uh, there were uh, comparatively more opportunities for uh, black people. And there were some large organized migrations, particularly from South Carolina. I would say a lot of the black folks in Arkansas today, if you traced their ancestors, your ancestors back to uh, when they came here, it probably wouldn't be to slavery. Uh, slaves on plantations in Arkansas, most uh, black Arkansans uh, families would have come to the state in the latter decades of the 1800s. Uh, one reason was, as I said, uh, just better situation in terms of rights, uh, but also a cheap available land uh, provided opportunities, economic opportunities uh, for people to be able to come in and acquire land, which was less possible for them in other parts of the country. Uh, so it's during the 1870s and 1880s that there come to be established some of the institutions uh, that will be quite important in creating a, a vibrant uh, life in black communities in Arkansas. Things like colleges, like the, on the slide there, Arkansas Baptist College, founded in 1884 in Little Rock, or Philander Smith College, founded in Little Rock as a Methodist school, or uh, what's today the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, a state university to prepare people to teach in, uh, in black schools, uh, founded uh, in the 1870s. So a lot of institutions, neighborhoods, uh, businesses, uh, opportunities, basically, I think, for Black folks uh, were there in the 1870s and 1880s uh, that would make it, in some ways, a bit of a golden age compared to the, what was before with slavery and what will come later. Uh, the photograph I have there on the top is of a, a group of Ar Arkansas folks who are headed off to be missionaries in Africa in the late 1800s. The older guy that's standing at the back uh, was a professor at Philander Smith College, and that's his wife and children. And then he's taking along with him a school teacher on the lower left who had just graduated from what is today UAPB, who was gonna teach school in Africa. And then to the right is a young man who was a student of his 
and his wife and so forth. So just a sign of well-dressed, respectable, educated uh, men and women who were leaders of the community in that period of time. I don't want to gloss over and say everything was great for everybody because there were certainly issues where there was struggle uh, in the 1870s and 1880s. One of them uh, particular was the practice of peonage or uh, so-called debt slavery. It was very easy for some uh, poor person, but particularly this was to be true for uh, people of color uh, to be thrown into prison for owing the smallest amount to some merchant or uh, being able to pay back to a plantation owner uh, uh, money or uh, that was uh, borrowed at the beginning for seeds and uh, fertilizer or whatnot. Uh, so, um, or vagrancy, it just it was real easy at this period of time for a uh, prison uh, to uh, fill up with uh, black uh, men, especially. And then there was even the practice of um, contracting those prisoners out to do various different uh, uh, jobs. Uh, for an, I think, uh, example, um, in Conway, we have a train uh, tunnel that was built on the north side of town, I think, back in the 1870s when that train tunnel was built. It was built uh, largely through labor uh, of, of uh, peonage. Uh, there's a really good book about peonage entitled Slavery by Another Name that uh, makes clear how oppressive it was. Uh, it won a Pulitzer Prize about 10 years ago. It was written by a graduate of Hendricks College. Uh, documentary with the same name appeared on PBS not too long ago. Okay, um, but in general, as, I'm, as I said, the 1870s and 1890s uh, had uh, in many ways uh, aspects that were quite positive for uh, the situation for people of color. Well, that changed very abruptly in the early 1890s. Arkansas, which had been a haven for people who were fleeing violence, oppression in South Carolina, in Louisiana, and Mississippi, in a matter of just a few years, became sort of a mirror image of those other states. And that happened uh, through a couple of measures that uh, took place or were put on the books by the state legislature uh, in 1890 and 1892. Uh, Arkansas was one of the first states to make a very clear and specific disfranchisement uh, process uh, through um, uh, legal actions, uh, laws put on the books uh, by the state legislature. So-called secret ballot uh, provision uh, to make it so that people who were illiterate uh, wouldn't be able to vote. The previous voting system uh, was such that an illiterate person to vote would simply get a, a pre-printed ticket that would even be color-coded and might have an insignia on it, like for Democrats. Uh, a, uh, a rooster, actually, they would use that instead of a donkey back in the day, or an elephant for the Republican. Uh, so that a literate person would know by the insignia on there or the color scheme, whether it was a Republican ballot or Democratic ballot. So all you had to do was sign or put an X on a um, sheet of paper uh, and then slip your uh, ballot into a box. Well, the law that went on the books in 19, 1890 actually was uh, in, by the session elected in 1890, went on the books in 1891, made it so that you had to be able to read. And sometimes there would be literacy tests or that the uh, election officials might ask complicated questions. Somehow black uh, prospective voters that they didn't ask of even poor white voters who also might be Ill illiterate. But the effect of it uh, was to basically remove almost all black people from voting between about 1890 and about 1894, 1896. Going with that was a poll tax law, which actually uh, where you had to pay a tax uh, to be able to vote. You had to pay it in advance, keep your receipt, show it if asked. And again, uh, election officials would be more likely to ask a black voter, uh, maybe not a white voter. Uh, but the net result of that was basically to remove those black votes uh, from the system. And that, of course, then would mean uh, black officials no longer elected. Uh, there won't be black officials uh, in Arkansas until after a Voting Rights Act in 1965 will begin to change that situation. Well, the same session that instituted disfranchisement also began the process of legal segregation in Arkansas with the so-called Jim Crow laws. Uh, the first one was a separate coach bill uh, to mandate that 
uh, black and white people couldn't sit on the same cars on trains or even in the same waiting room to wait for a train. It was a beginning point, but of course it will lead to basically all kind of public facilities, restaurants, um, um, drinking fountains, washrooms, uh, you name it, uh, being segregated. And of course that will last again from the 1890s until that system is undone in the 1960s. And then uh, if the legal changes weren't enough, uh, to sort of make it clear what the situation was, uh, there was an outburst of violence, racial violence in the early 1890s, particularly lynchings and some of them spectacle lynchings where crowds of maybe 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 people gathered to watch uh, an illegal execution basically. Uh, in the early 1890s, uh, there were so many lynchings in Arkansas that for the period when these changes are taking place, uh, it would, I, I could make the argument that uh, a black man was more likely to be lynched in Arkansas than in any other state. Following on that would be other kinds of measures of violence, uh, some famous ones and some less well-known ones. Uh, in certain areas where there are small black communities, um, there was ethnic cleansing, what we will call later in the century, ethnic cleansing, where literally uh, white uh, neighbors uh, just simply ran uh, the small black uh, communities out of their town. That happened in Harrison, it happened in Cotter, in Mena, and some other locations. And then a good number of those towns and some other towns, uh, particularly in the, the white areas of the state, uh, will become in the early uh, 20th century, the so-called sundown towns uh, that would uh, enforce an all white uh, uh, residency uh, year in, year out. Okay, well, there will be some response to uh, this dramatic change that happens for black folks uh, in the early 1890s. Well, when it was happening, uh, there were members uh, of the legislature uh, black legislators in both the Senate and the House who very uh, eloquently spoke against these bills, but they, there were min minority voices and they it failed. There'll be other uh, attempts at uh, resistance or response to this, such as in uh, the early 1900s and 1903 in Little Rock and some other communities, segregated streetcars uh, in Little Rock, Pine Bluff and Hot Springs, uh, black uh, people uh, boycotted uh, businesses uh, and, and you know, tried to uh, use pressure of the group uh, to uh, put pressure on the uh, authorities to change the system unsuccessfully in all cases. One more um, response that became increasingly popular was simply to leave. I don't think always we consider immigration or migration to be uh, a form of resistance, but it was certainly. Uh, in the beginning in the 1880s and in the 1890s, there was a very strong movement in Arkansas among black uh, families and black communities uh, to, to leave not just Arkansas or the United States, but uh, and the United States, but to return to a ancestral homeland of Africa. Uh, and in fact, there were more than 600 black Arkansans uh, in the 1880s and the 1890s who immigrated to Liberia, a country that had been founded in the 1800s in Africa uh, as a place for um, displaced Africans uh, to return to. Uh, and in fact, there were more um, uh, immigrants from Arkansas in that, those two decades than from any other state in the United States, even though Arkansas's black population would be much smaller than Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. Uh, there were more uh, immigrants who left for Africa from Arkansas than anywhere else. Another alternative was leaving for Oklahoma. Uh, again, this seems a little preposterous maybe by modern standards. Oklahoma at that point was a territory, not yet a state. Uh, and so it was under federal law rather than uh, Arkansas or southern, uh, southern state law. Uh, and so there was an attempt to uh, uh, form migration movements uh, from Arkansas and other southern states to Oklahoma with the idea that they would found there all black towns. And there were literally about 30 towns that were founded to be all black towns, places that would have uh, black officials, black businesses, black physicians, uh, with the idea that 
black people then wouldn't have to ever see a white person. It's, it's really a sign of how dire uh, the oppression was in the relationship between the races that uh, this would be an aspiration for people that they would want to uh, get away from um, white people to an all black world. It's kind of reminiscent of the back to Africa movement. Um, but you know, if that wasn't possible, there was a Oklahoma. And then of course, what would be more common as we go forward in time, certainly more significant in terms of the numbers would be for uh, black Arkansans to leave for points to the north, uh, to places like St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago, Detroit. Of course, this was happening throughout the South in the 1900s and the 19 teens into the 1920s and really will continue thereafter. Uh, I, I have a, a handbill that was uh, posted uh, trying to encourage black people to come to a meeting, this one in particular in 1890, to discuss immigration, just to make, show you this was a real movement. Uh, I love this uh, handbill because it just speaks to the uh, authenticity of the movement and the uh, um, appeal and the uh, almost anxious, feverish desire that they had to get out of Arkansas. If you had time and uh, could read the whole thing, I think you would uh, find it meaningful. Uh, I put together a little chart to show uh, what the numbers look like uh, with the black percentage of Arkansas's population to just show you where it started out, uh, where uh, during the time of slavery, we were in the teens and the 20s percentiles, but then notice the percentage went up to the high 20s, um, uh, to around 28% uh, by 1890 and stayed there. Uh, even though there was considerable outmigration in the 1890s and the 1900s and the 1910s, but there was also uh, natural population growth as well. But just notice the curve there uh, at the time of uh, um, when things were at their worst, uh, people took action uh, by leaving. And as we've seen, the uh, percentage of the population uh, that's of color in Arkansas has declined uh, since uh, this time period that I'm talking about now, the 1920s, teens and 20s. Let me go forward to the teens uh, and the impact of World War I on race relations in the United States and in Arkansas in particular. Um, it could have been, and I think many people thought it might be, again, a moment of great promise uh, because we find black men volunteering to serve uh, in the army. And in fact, many of them doing that, something like totally uh, 380,000 black men serving uh, in the American military during the war, and some of them actually serving in the trenches with weapons. More often, they were doing uh, more menial tasks, were given jobs of service like cooking or waiting on officers or other kinds of things. But nonetheless, you know, black and white men serving their country uh, during World War I, or the Great War it was called then, certainly would raise the aspirations uh, of black men who were veterans. When they come back to the United States in 1918 and 1919, uh, they, many people clearly thought it's a moment that's ripe for change. They had paid their dues. They had been loyal to their country. Their country should be loyal to them back. But instead, what happens right on the uh, tail end of World War I is that their hopes were crushed with uh, oppression uh, that was in fact even perhaps more strident than what had existed before. As there's some greater assert assertiveness amongst especially some of these black veterans, uh, the, the pushback was even greater and there would be riots and massacres uh, that took place in this period, 18, 1918, especially 19 in Washington, D.C., in Omaha, Nebraska, Knoxville, Tennessee, Chicago, and other places. But probably the greatest of them all was in Elaine, Arkansas in October of 1919, Phillips County, Arkansas. And that's where uh, a black veteran of the war um, met with some other uh, hardworking um, people that worked as cotton pickers in the cotton uh, fields of Phillips County, the southern part of Phil Phillips County, and he tried to organize a union of um, unskilled cotton workers, uh, agriculturalists. Uh, and when they were meeting in a church just outside Elaine, Arkansas, um, somebody started shooting as some a sheriff's deputy uh, uh, approach from the outside. It's not real clear exactly how it started, 
Uh, but once the shooting started, it became a massacre. Over the next few days, in Elaine, uh, white uh, mobs, posses gathered, uh, some from Mississippi, some people came down from the Memphis area, uh, and it became basically a, a, a massacre uh, of, of black people. Uh, the governor of, in, from Little Rock sent down even uh, troops, mostly uh, veterans who were at Camp Pike, what's today uh, Camp um, uh, Robinson, uh, previously called Camp Pike, uh, who were still mobilized uh, in uniform and sent them down hardened veterans who knew how to use a machine gun. Uh, and uh, it, it appears that as many as perhaps 200 uh, black men and women were just simply killed. Uh, in this supposed riot of the black people, uh, but really uh, it used to be called uh, for many years the Elaine Race Riot. Uh, now I think we've begun to call it what it really was, uh, the Elaine Race Massacre. Around 200 is the best number I think historians generally agree on, although there have been estimates that uh, go as high as 800. At the time, white authorities said 20, a uh, couple of dozen, uh, were the number of black uh, people who were dead when it was over, uh, but ultimately we don't know. But it's one of the worst moments really in the history of race uh, in this country, uh, but largely not that well known. There's been more attention about it in recent years, just last fall, quite a bit of media attention uh, when the 100th anniversary uh, came along and there was a monument placed uh, in Helena um, but even that I had some quite a bit of controversy um, and I expect it will be more discussed uh, uh, as we go forward in time. So a moment of promise that didn't deliver. And then that leads us into the 1920s. Uh, I call it the angry 20s when there was just almost like a, a, a blossoming of prejudice on so many different levels. And it gets institutionalized in the 1920s. Uh, in uh, the uh, form of the Ku Klux Klan, a new Ku Klux Klan, not the same one that had been there during Reconstruction, but it was reorganized. Some of the same symbolism uh, was used, but uh, it's in basically a brand new organization dedicated to things like white supremacy. Uh, but this new Klan, the second Klan, they were sort of equal opportunity bigots. They also were uh, uh, hostile to Catholics, to Jews, to immigrants, many of whom were Catholics and Jews. And of course, it's the era of prohibition. So uh, one of their targets became uh, boot bootleggers and moonshiners, or just the generally shiftless and immoral. Um, so they had a very long agenda of groups that they don't like. But it was truly a powerful organization when you have something that's an institution, an organization to channel prejudice, and that's really what uh, the Klan was. Uh, and it was all over the South, all over the country, all over Arkansas. I've been able to identify at least 152 uh, Klan chapters uh, in official Klan chapters in Arkansas. Uh, so almost every little town uh, in Arkansas had a chapter. And Arkansas was one of the leading states uh, in the Klan. The uh, Grand Dragon for Arkansas was on the inner circle of the Klan. Uh, which had its headquarters in Atlanta, uh, but uh, because the Grand Dragon of Arkansas was such a big wheel in the Klan, he was able to secure Little Rock as the headquarters, world headquarters, of the women's auxiliary of the Klan, the women of the KKK, uh, and his uh, uh, former secretary that you see in the picture there, whom he later married, uh, became the imperial commander uh, for the KKK, the women of the KKK. Uh, this map gives you some sense of the geographic distribution of the Klan in the 1920s. And of course it did some uh, terrorism and violence uh, against people of color, but also against some Catholics, against boot bootleggers, moochiners, uh, wife beaters. Uh, it had actually a fairly long list of people that could uh, come under the wrath of the Klan. I would suggest to you that the worst years um, in race relations in Arkansas were between the beginning of this disfranchisement Jim Crow legislation around 1890 up through 1927, 
1927, the Klan was sort of on, it last, on its last legs, but there was a bit of a last gasp of the kind of ugly, heavy-handed racism uh, associated with the 1920s, and that was with the lynching, uh, one of the hor most horrendous lynchings, really in Southern history, certainly Arkansas history, of a man named John Carter uh, that happened in Little Rock. Actually, it happened just outside of Little Rock in May of 1927. Uh, and it forms a bit of a bookend to uh, the worst violence because, in fact, it was so outrageous that it caused some citizens to stop and reflect. And I think you can sense a, a bit of a different tone uh, that begins to come in on the other side uh, of the John Carter lynching. Uh, he had uh, been accused of um, uh, abusing a white woman and her daughter, jumping on their uh, wagon, actually, and on, on the west side of Little Rock. Uh, until an automobile was coming along that was full of white people. He jumped down, ran off. Uh, the woman said that he had attacked her, uh, but there was also an alternate story that circulated in the black community that uh, the wagon uh, that was pulled by a horse, the horse had uh, risen up uh, and, at a loud noise, and he jumped on the wagon to actually protect uh, the family, to steady the wagon, uh, and then the carload of whites came up and uh, thought the opposite, and so he ran for his life. Uh, but eventually, uh, mobs of white men from Little Rock uh, searched the area and found him. And this photograph you see there in the, uh, on the slide is the uh, hanging uh, uh, from a tree there just outside of Little Rock. But after they finished hanging him, uh, they shot his body full of uh, tw 200 times. Uh, uh, and then they uh, took his body off and put it on a hood of a car, drove it into Little Rock uh, on a parade through the streets of downtown Little Rock, right by City Hall, uh, where the police station was, uh, and then took him to 9th and Broadway, uh, which was really the center of the black downtown area, the business district of uh, Little Rock, and where they um, created a bonfire and burned his body in basically just a melee that lasted about three hours until finally the governor called out uh, troops and, and put an end to it. Uh, the city police of Little Rock uh, were sitting in the basement of City Hall playing cards as this was happening. Uh, the city basically uh, controlled by the Klan, uh, the police, uh, city officials. Uh, the government, governor himself had been out of town and he was a bit of a more, had a, a bigger moral streak and when he comes back into town, he puts an end to it. But it gave Little Rock a black eye nationally. This was covered in the press all throughout the country. Uh, and, you know, 30 years before Central High, 1957, Little Rock became somewhat infamous for uh, uh, acts of violence against uh, people of color. In fact, as I said, it was so outrageous that we found various groups after the Carter lynching began to say, we can do better. Um, I would say in the period that follows 1927, things did get better. The, the worst kind of violence uh, slows down or stops, but of course the prejudice, the um, uh, Jim Crow segregation, uh, that's all gonna remain. Of course, then we get to the 1950s and the 1960s when truly change begins. I call it a sea change because it's so significant and so and it touches so many areas of people's lives uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, and I, uh, I'm showing you the iconic photograph I'm sure that you've seen before that is sort of the, the moment uh, in, uh, in Arkansas that we're famous for in our connection with the civil rights movement. And, and you know, it's a story of courage and uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, it's an ugly story, but it's also a story of heroism. Um, um, and the uh, world knows it, you know, it's, it's been well written about by historians. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about the civil rights movement. I think I'm going to bring my um, comments to a close here pretty soon because I think it's the part of the story uh, that I expect you know better uh, than the part that I've talked about to this point. Uh, so just to remind you of some things that you already know. Uh, the, civil, the Central High moment in 1957, certainly well known to you, but I don't know if everyone realizes that the next year, the next school year, 1958 to 1959, the governor and the state legislature closed the high schools of Little Rock, and there was no school 
for all the high school students uh, unless they could find some other kind of alternate education. Um, about most of the, of the black students uh, did not. Most of the white students could find another way to get an education that next year. Uh, but imagine a, a whole school year where the people of Little Rock, in fact, there was a referendum on it, uh, voted to close the schools rather than have integration. Uh, it was never easy. Uh, and, you know, after the Central High uh, moment of, of the late 50s, uh, the Civil Rights Movement in Arkansas progressed in bits and pieces. Uh, it's actually kind of hard to generalize about it because uh, it might progress in one town fairly swiftly and calmly, but in another town, uh, much more conflicted. It might happen in one area uh, much earlier than another area. Uh, I remember in 1964, as a second grader, all of a sudden, the beginning of that year, in my elementary school, black kids were there. They weren't there the first year, my first year in first grade. Uh, so it happened in some communities in the early 60s, others in mid 60s. Conway, for example, integrated the schools in the later 1960s. But in the uh, Delta of Arkansas, the areas where the largest number of uh, uh, black folks lived, uh, integration was the last to arrive. Uh, I even have a friend who um, uh, told me rather recently that uh, she graduated from an all black school in Hempstead County in uh, Washington in Hempstead County in 1979. And I was scratching my head about that because by, I thought by that time uh, integration had uh, met or arrived in all parts of Arkansas, but uh, perhaps as late as the late seventies, it was still reaching some areas. As I said, it wasn't easy. It took struggle. It took work by students like uh, Philander Smith College students who sat down in the Woolworth counter in Little Rock or uh, UAPB students who did the same in Pine Bluff. Uh, the work by the NAACP led by the uh, a couple, uh, LC and Daisy Bates of great civil rights fame. Uh, outsiders from Arkansas who came to the area uh, as freedom riders later in the 60s, the SNCC or Student National Coordinating Committee, all kinds of different people participated in it. Uh, and uh, eventually we get to the 70s where we think that things got better. Uh, someone like myself who went through the 60s when it was happening and became an adult in the 70s, uh, somehow most of us, many of us assumed, well, we're on this side of the civil rights movement. It has arrived. Uh, but I guess uh, I just would bring to your attention some of the issues that I think you'll hear more about when other speakers uh, and discussions take place later today, that we've seen patterns uh, since the civil rights movement that have brought more problems, uh, and such as resegregation of schools. And I just have some selective examples. I expect you'll hear more about this as we go the Little Rock School District that was 72% white in 1963, now is 19% white. Or resegregation of neighborhoods, uh, where a town like Pine Bluff could go from being 41% black in 1970 to 77% black now. Or Little Rock, uh, where we have a um, 630 expressway to open up white migration to the western part of town or economic disparities. I think we have a session on that this afternoon. Uh, the map that you see there shows the, air, the counties that have the highest poverty rate in Arkansas and the relationship between uh, black population in those areas I think is somewhat obvious. And then again, we're gonna have a session on uh, the criminal justice system uh, and just an anecdotal uh, piece of evidence that you know uh, today or recently uh, when Blacks are 16% of the state's population, they're 41% of the prison population. So hopefully we can uh, learn more about that as we go. And I'll just end with this last uh, slide, last thought. Uh, as we in the last months have gone through uh, momentous um, public discussions in the streets, in the classroom, uh, in sessions like we're having today uh, about civil rights and what it truly means, uh, I'm wondering or asking, leaving you with the question, will we look back at the Black Lives Matter movement as the new civil rights movement? Uh, will it bring us a change as we've seen 
uh, with the, the changes, preliminary as they may have been, that took place in the 1950s and the 1960s. And I'll stop there. Dr. Barnes, thank you so much for that presentation. I know in the chat, I saw several people talking about how, um, you know, we intentionally started off this day because we need to know where we have been to know where we need to go. And I think that that, that overview that you provided really set us up to be successful for the rest of our agenda. And I want to thank you so much for providing um, those, that information that you were able to provide. And I do have a few questions for you. Um, before we get to the questions, I do want to share that the chat has been very active. Thank you guys so much for uh, communicating with one another, having open discussions, already getting that conversation flowing, and so many resources have been shared in our chat already. And I do want everyone to know that we are going to be taking those resources. We can save the chat from the Zoom, and we're gonna take those notes and put them in a follow-up email to everybody. So if for some reason you don't see everything that's coming through the chat and record all the resources, don't worry, we're gonna take care of that for you. Um, and I do uh, want to go back to Dr. Barnes real quick. We did have a question come through for you, Dr. Barnes, and if anyone else has any questions, please add them to the chat now. Uh, but one I saw was about the 1619 project um, and can we get your opinion um, about it? Well, I, I am not, I haven't read the material of the 1619, uh, but the general approach that we need to rethink how we teach history, how we look at our history to incorporate different perspectives. I certainly think it's long time coming. Uh, and uh, as someone educated in Arkansas, growing up and going to public schools here, I realized how what I was taught uh, and even what my children were taught has reflected a perspective of the history written um, by white people like myself. Uh, and there's a, there are views that just have not been incorporated uh, into the, the story, then it's high time they do it. That's my opinion. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Barnes. Um, and let me scroll back down to my chat. I was getting something else. I don't think we had any more questions, uh, but a lot more resources coming in. Um, and I, once again, I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Barnes, for that presentation. The presentation will also be sent out um, as a resource, um, so everybody can count on getting the PowerPoint presentation in a follow-up email. 